Welcome to Raptor Talk. I'm Raisa Serafica from Raptor Civic Engagement Arm, Move PH. Today, we'll be joined by somebody who made history in a way. Uh, two years ago, she graduated as the first female summa cum laude of UP's PA history. Welcome, Shike Concilio. Hi. Two years ago, and it's <coughs> been two years since you graduated. I'm sure you have an idea that you'll be graduating as summa cum laude, but what was your first reaction when you learned that you are the first female UP summa cum laude from your college department? Okay, uh, so when I found out, I was actually in a, an environmental camp in Barakay, and the structure of the camp um, was such that we were not advised to touch our phones until the end of the day so we could concentrate on the activities. So that day that the news was released, I was just out in the beach the whole day and then around early evening or like nine, I just remembered getting my phone and then being a bit overwhelmed with all the notifications and then messages from from people, not necessarily people I knew. And and then lo and behold, my department posted uh, a photo of me, my very awkward sublai photo. And it was so awkward with my jiwa and then the caption. And that was the first time I heard. That was when I actually found out that I was the first female and the fourth person. Before that, I had no idea at all. I just had, and I like more or less, I knew what my grade was and that what honors I would be graduating with, but not that I would be so and so. Um, what did you feel now? Yeah. Pala yung first female. Uh, I didn't really know what to make of it at the moment, but I mean, I found it cool, um, and of course, like when. Later that night before I slept, of course, the feeling was like, it's my honor because looking at the, the previous ones, it was nice to know. Although, I mean, I'd put an asterisk on me being the first female mm -hmm. because if I remember correctly, the, the post of the department mentioned that there was a previous um, holder of the same um, like honors, but she wasn't... Technically, she wasn't in the AB history course. I'm not really sure. I think she was in education, but majoring in mm. history. So I think I still think it counts. <laughs> yeah. But, but still, just check that. I'm not really yes. sure anymore. But still, before you, there there were only three summa cum laudes um, mm -hmm. from from your college. Mm -hmm. How is it difficult, ba, when you were studying history? Um, I I can't really speak for everyone, but. I don't think difficult is the right word because it is what you make of it. I think maybe it just helped a lot that I really enjoyed it. And even now, looking back, when I applied for UP, I took the entire list of available courses and I was crossing out everything one by one until um, I was like, until I end up with something I feel I can. Um, connect with and in the end it was really just history <laughs> so um, yeah I really enjoyed it it didn't feel so much like work uh, and then I mean I, I tried to have a system to doing things but in the end it was it wasn't like I aimed specifically for that it was a pleasant surprise what made the subject or the topic of history attractive to you my, my interest in history probably started in third year high school. My history teacher then, it was um, our Philippine history teacher. She was previously a professor uh, teacher in UP before going to our high school. And her way of teaching really captured my interest and attention. And it, was, it wasn't the spoon feeding type where you know, like, how do I say it? Socratic method, or she'd really like draw the answers to your questions from you yourself. And I really liked that we were forced to think critically, and there was no one definite answer to, to a specific problem or issue. And it also helped that my dad studied history, so 
consciously or not, I enjoyed listening to his stories and talking about, you know, the value systems of our family or or the community or even the country. And um, traveling also uh, made me curious about how we ended up. It's very really interesting because it's like you don't know the history, but I think. It's not a popular subject or topic. Yeah, we were like 10 in our no. batch who graduated. Really? <laughs> yeah. So usually if people hear or know that you're taking up history or you graduated from history, what are the usual reactions? Like blank stares. <laughs> <laughs> um, they go like, oh, so what are you doing now? Or, or the usual question when I was a student was like, oh, so are you going to take law? Um, which I considered too. But like, it's usually just like, Okay, so what are you gonna do next? Because it's not the most lucrative um, course, but I would argue that it is more practical than people make it out to be. During college, were you at any point apprehensive that um, you won't get a job or you'll have a hard time <laughs> getting a job? Um, I think it crosses everyone's minds uh, at some point in college, but maybe I would understand it's it occurs more often. This is just my guess mm. in students of the social sciences or humanities. But I think that that's changing now. Um, but when I would think of that, to be honest, throughout undergrad, I always thought and was, I just assumed I would take up law. And um, I was already set to, to go to law school. And my decision not to was a last minute one. So in college, I didn't really think about like getting a job or like how mm. difficult would it be, etc. But of course, I mean, I didn't end up studying law. My, I found that my heart was somewhere else. So that's a different story. You also mentioned a while ago that your father is also into history. And I th it felt like it runs in your blood I'm sure you have a prominent last name. Um, are you related in some way to Theodoro? To, to Chidoro Alvinsilio, Filipino historian Chidoro um, It's always been difficult for me to answer that, and I don't know why I haven't clarified it until now. <laughs> but then, like throughout undergrad, my professors would also ask me, and I see why, especially after like that news piece. But um, I can't say for sure, but. I remember asking my dad, and I was like, for once and for all, can we find out <laughs> so I can um, give a straightforward answer? And all he could give me was that his cousin, his distant cousin, who's like the family's resident genealogist, but I think he's a doctor by trade, mm -hmm. um, he said that he found documents linking us to Theodora Agoncillo, but then I, I'll, I'm still skeptical. I mean, I'd rather see it myself and maybe double, triple check. But then um, we are also from Taal. My dad's side has roots in Taal, where some other Agoncillas are from. So maybe. Um, about <coughs> you, what you said a while ago, that you, um, when you said that your heart um, is elsewhere, um, can you elaborate on that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> OK, so I can't say for sure because I'm still figuring things out. And it was kind of like uh, a jump, a leap of faith when I decided not to go for law because um, when you're so set on a specific track and then suddenly you realize, wait, I think I might be more interested in another. It's unsettling. Um, but it started in my junior year when I started taking uh, what in UP we call as cognates. So I'm not sure about the other courses, but then in history and a few other of the programs in the College of Social Sciences and Philosophy were required to elect a, a cognate, which is kind of comparable to a minor. And I started taking units in geography, and especially my course in economic geography, um, resource management and conservation, even cultural geography. It really opened my eyes to sticking to the social sciences. And little by little, especially with my experiences, my extracurricular activities, and my engagements outside of school, writing papers for conferences, um, I realized that my heart was in development. 
and it made sense. Like if I connected the dots backward, you know, what were my extracurricular activities in high school and college? They were always working with NGOs or nonprofits, and it just made sense. It clicked in the end. Since we're already talking about your um, experience studying um, during college, how did you maintain your your grades all throughout those four years? Okay, so I see you there, the, <laughs> the titles like tips for studying, but before this I was laughing yeah. because I'm not really going to give tips. I don't think I'm qualified to give tips because I feel like everyone has different work ethic and what may have worked for me may not work for others. Plus, it's not like I had a secret formula, but um, what maintained it. So my first two years in college, to be honest, were more like out of curiosity I just wanted to see how far I would go if I like really did my best and then I think the turning point was the summer between my second and third year when I had so much on my plate and I had to kind of like reevaluate my priorities and then trim down my commitments based on what I wanted to achieve so I out of fairness like to my to a few orgs and my colleagues there and you know looking after also my, my health because I felt like I could burn out if I didn't set certain boundaries so I decided to let go of a few other commitments and then that really helped me I mean I didn't become inactive in the select orgs that I uh, was committed to but then I made sure that I wouldn't compromise school but like that's not to say that what I prioritized or like what I put importance on is what others should because I mean we all have different yeah. like intelligences and competencies and I merely played to my strengths mm -hmm. in in a way that I felt I could best contribute to society and that might not be the same mm -hmm. for everyone so other people I saw that they really really excelled and thrived in in working with their orgs and outside of school, which is really great, yeah. I think it's common um, among UP students to have several organizations. BA org. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so you also <coughs> mentioned that there, um, you had to choose or choose your battles. Yes. Um, what are your tips to students who need to juggle several priorities? How to manage their priorities or time effectively? Mm. This is something I am still learning. Um, you know, when, when I was able to pull off something like that in college, I felt like, oh, I, I know the secret formula. I, I know how to prioritize my commitments, etc. But then, you know, even after college and as I was working, volunteering with people, it was still a challenge that I had to get used to because college is a whole different ballgame from after college but what always helps uh, I love my planners um, I love writing things down because I don't know if those studies are true but they say that if you write your tasks down you're more likely to accomplish them but I was very firm with myself in terms of like oops no tonight uh, I have to stay home just finish this or but I would also celebrate the little victories like I couldn't just be cooped up in my place the whole time or I'd, I'd go crazy so uh, just just the right balance and um, I think it's pretty common sense it's just practice um, after UP you also mentioned that it's a learning process so after UP what were you um, able to to apply what you learned in history or? I think regardless of what anyone studies and regardless of the path they choose to take there's always something to take from what you studied but uh, okay so in my case it was a challenge because precisely like I said I thought I was gonna do something and then very last minute I changed my mind and decided I think I want to try this so the challenge there was I realized I was really interested in a field in which you know I didn't take classes mm -hmm. and I wasn't as familiar with it. So in a way, I really had to start from scratch, relearn concepts and theories that you know, other people, if they knew they were going to do this, would have 
taken up in undergrad. And so I told myself I didn't think it would be wise to, to you know, tie myself down to a two to three year contract right away and not be sure if, if that was my kind of working environment, if there are just so many factors that come into play. So it really depends a lot on your fit for the role, timing, even luck and mm -hmm. other personal circumstances. But in the end, I felt like I had to take a gap year mm -hmm. just to dabble here and there. I mean, I knew more or less what track I wanted to take, but I wanted to try development in different sectors. So um, I always kind of knew I wasn't for corporate, but I wanted to give it a shot anyway so that I could get it out of the way. So my first internship was a corporate internship, which I learned a lot, but I knew it wasn't for me. And then after that, um, I traveled a bit, did research in grad schools because I knew, I always knew I wanted to study again, whether it be law or something else. And then I did volunteer work for an NGO. Um, I took up internships in government. Um, I particularly enjoyed like working at the Senate where I did policy work. And then after that, I spent a few months abroad where I also took summer school in Manchester and then I finally came back and then started work first with um, a, a startup, an agri-tech startup that helps smallholder farmers get capital. And then finally, I'm doing policy work. I'm a policy assistant in a research and policy nonprofit. So I kind of like hopped all yes. over the place and this was not what I expected at mm -hmm. all after college and it has its pros and cons, mm -hmm. but no regrets. Jumping off from that, since um, how has your liberal education shaped your worldview and influenced your decisions in what path to take? I am uh, an advocate of a liberal arts education because it really puts you more in touch with your own humanity. And that is not so much a skill that can be learned, you know, in the office as easily as, say, coding or, I mean, these are all good and noble pursuits, but then the humanities, there's just something very different about it. And I am able to, you know, communicate with others better because I feel like I can try to understand their worldview more and really to dig deep into, into their, their biographies as people. And it also helps you be more tolerant of others without necessarily sacrificing your values, but just trying to understand where they're coming from and looking for common ground and understanding the context of different political events and social issues, etc. So I don't know, I think it's helped me be more grounded and. Uh, more in touch with the world and with other people. Before we wrap up, for a last question, um, what would you advise students who would like to take a course in history or other, or other strands in liberal arts education? Well, the only thing I can say is really to, to just go for it. Uh, it was, I can't really say, my parents were very supportive, but unfortunately, I've encountered a lot of young students who cannot say the same. Um, I also understand where their parents are coming from because maybe they want their kids to choose a more practical or a safe program. But then, luckily for us, the world is evolving and we're no longer boxed into the opportunities that people think certain decisions limit you to doing. So yeah, just go for it and then always, always be careful with, with anything you study and try to do it in the service of truth. Um, and yeah, just do your best and everything will fall into place. <laughs> just to again put things in con context, since um, you graduated in a, during a digital age, right? Yeah. So how would you um, situate your history background with this? Context. With like the digital yes. age, um, it's a double-edged sword, just because you know um, 
everything is so much more accessible, especially information. I get so jealous uh, when I hear about new technologies that make it so much easier for students to research and write papers. And like even my experience in school abroad, just seeing how, how much a difference um, digital technology makes in education. But at the same time, it's so much easier also to spread um, like, you know, f false things, falsehoods, yeah. misunderstandings. So it really depends on how you use the medium. Um, but I'm trying to stay positive, especially, you know, because people are more open to debate and dialogue now about how do we fix uh, our online tools so that we can protect things like democracy or freedom of speech or the accuracy of, of news pieces and, and things like that. Thank you, Chiki, for joining us today. I'm sure our viewers learned a lot from your experience. Thanks for having me also. Thank you for joining us today. I am Raisa Sirafika and this is Raptor Talk.